Hello, this is Rob Hopkins, and uh, I want to share with you uh, part of a chapter from uh, From What Is to What If, unleashing the power of imagination to create the future we want. And it feels like a, a section that's particularly relevant and powerful at this time of coronavirus, because it's about our ability to ask good what if questions, which if we can cultivate one key skill during this time of lockdown, this time of coronavirus, I would argue that it is our ability to leave lockdown when this finishes with the power to ask really, really great what if questions, to frame them, to present them, to, to enact them. And so I want to read the first few pages of this chapter, which is called, What If We Started Asking Better Questions? The bus turning circle off Tooting High Street in South London is an unloved place. Home to buses idling their engines next to homes that overlook the constant coming and going noise and exhaust fumes. Along one side, opposite the houses, is a huge Primark store. The circle is a place that is as unremarkable as it is unloved. A grey space people walk through without noticing, not a place people would ever meet or stop to have a conversation. Tooting itself is a district that lacks a centre, a heart, a village green, being largely strung out along its busy high street, one of London's main arterial roads. But if there were a centre to Tooting, it would be this circle. It's not a place that inspires much joy, carnival or creativity, and certainly not dancing in the streets. Until, that is, members of transition town Tooting looked at the bus turning circle with fresh eyes and asked, what if this bus turning circle were, in fact our village green. And so one Sunday in July 2017, having crowdfunded nearly £2,000, a team of volunteers set about transforming the Tooting Circle into a village green for a day. Buses were routed down the road, volunteers brought out benches, erected a speaker's platform, rolled strips of grass onto the tarmac, decorated with potted trees, wheelbarrows full of potted plants, handheld windmills, bunting in an arched entryway for people to pass through as they entered from the high street. A ukulele band and Sikh doll drummers provided the music alongside instruments available to anyone who wanted to strike a chord. Complimentary food was provided by a local restaurant as the smell of Ethiopian coffee wafted through. The local neighbourhood plan group showed up, making use of legislation that enables communities to create their own legally recognised local development plans, as did a guy named Dr Bike, who, people's, who fixed people's bikes for free. The newly elected MP for Tooting, Rosina Alin Khan, dropped by to give a short speech. Kids made drawings and brought them to life with a pedal-powered zeotrope. Other kids played in the street in spontaneous games of four square and hopscotch. One girl persuaded people to lie down in the road, a suicidal thing to do on any other day, and traced their bodies with chalk. Led by the drummers, a parade passed through it all, its participants twirling and turning in circles through and round the bus-turning circle. By the end of the day, the long wall of Primark, which anyone would normally pass by without even noticing, had become the focus of many conversations about what to paint on it, how to use it to tell the best stories about ourselves. I took off my shoes and socks on that sunny afternoon and felt the vibrant, albeit temporary, green, green grass of tooting between my toes, along with a sense of possibility that in a few years I might return to visit the newly inaugurated tooting village green with even bigger, even more colourful, even noisier celebration. In addition to creating an oasis of colour and creativity, the tooting twirl, as it was called, created something very powerful that day. Rather than asking, what would happen if this space were our village green? It was giving people a taste of what it would be like when it was the village green. As Hilary Jennings of Transition Town Tooting told me, I don't think it's possible for anyone who's been here today, or walked through it, or walked past it, to not see this space a bit differently. Once you've seen it without the buses, and you've seen it like this, it's planted in your mind. I don't see how you could go back from that. This chapter is about how we can start asking different questions, specifically questions that begin with what if, and that help us to unlock the imagination in service to the big challenges we face. It's about more than the question per se, however. The question simply begins to open the door, creating a crack through which we might push and rush to the other side. It is an invitation as much as a question. It is a space we hold and create, and the question is the beginning of that. 
what authors Eric Liu and Scott Nope Brandon call the move from what is to what if. At a time when such spaces seem in short supply, what if becomes the perfect antidote to there is no alternative. As Transition Town Tooting organiser Lucy Neal told me during the Tooting Twirl, the event created the expectation of change, seeding the idea in people's imaginations so that nobody can say it isn't possible. What we have today is evidence, she said. When a proposal is made, no one can say it's not possible. It is absolutely possible to move the buses. We've done that. The joy and the delight of this is to step forward a bit, to be a little bit daring and a little bit courageous, saying, well, what if? What if we did that? We have just played with the idea of what could be possible, but let nobody say after today that it's not possible. What was so brilliant about asking what if this turning space were in fact our village green is that it left within it enough space for other people to ask different questions, new questions, to consider their place, their role in it, and yet at the same time to remain safe, held, celebratory, an element of freedom and an element of constraint. All too often that is not the experience of consulting others where the outcome has already been determined by the organisers or experts and there's no role for others to step into. What else makes a good what-if question? Ruth Bentovim of Encounters Arts describes three key elements. The first is that the people asking it have to be genuinely curious because the people you're asking will have an instinctive understanding if the question is coming from a genuine place of curiosity and openness or not. The second is that it must be a question that can be answered in many different ways. It ignites a possibility of response from many different angles and a trust that the responses will be accepted. And thirdly, it should offer a sideways look at something that triggers a moment of pause, like lifting a curtain, she told me, a glimpse of something you can step into. Lucy Neal, who often co collaborates with Ruth Bentovim, adds, you have to hold your intention quite clearly, which is that it's a genuine offer, that you're not going to sell them a car or something. We are bombarded with such offers all the time. As Antanas Mokas, the former mayor of Bogota, puts it, what people love most is when you write on the blackboard a risky first half of a sentence and then recognise their freedom to write the other half. There is also the necessary element of constraint or limit in this openness and freedom. Imagination without limits is like typing nothing into a search engine and expecting to get something useful when you press return. Narrowing the target area is vital for firing the imagination, what the French call bricolage, meaning do-it-yourself, or a construction made of whatever materials are at hand. The storyteller Martin Shaw uh, explains, boundless Endless freedom, oddly, doesn't engender imagination. What engenders imagination for me is a deadline and some limits. Poetic forms give writers shapes to work within, enabling them to create depth and beauty that resonate far beyond their apparent constraints, creating worlds that capture and fire the imagination. Paul Valéry, Paul Valéry wrote, A person who is a poet, if his imagination is stimulated by the difficulties inherent in his art, and not if his imagination is dulled by them. Fortunately, if we choose to look at it this way, there are many difficulties inherent in the art of solving the world's biggest problems, plenty of constraints, plenty of limits. One response to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's 2018 statement that we need rapid, urgent, far reach sorry, we need rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society is to kick against that, deny that, to say it's impossible. Another response is to look at it as a historic, once-off invitation to our brilliance. What if we were to massively de-escalate the crisis of anxiety across our culture? What if every university declared a climate and ecological emergency and all of its courses were taught through that lens? What if we created a fossil fuel free energy system within 20 years? What if every new house built generated more energy than it consumed? What if urban agriculture became utterly commonplace? What if our cities became huge biodiversity reserves? What if single-use plastics were something we only saw in museums? In what she called her green eggs and ham hypothesis, the psycholo psychologist Catherine L. Hort-Tromp 
argues that constraints can increase creativity, as Dr Seuss found when invited by his publisher to write a book containing just 50 different words. Focusing the creative energy on a narrower field of exploration allows for a more in-depth processing of fewer alternatives. Once a frame is in place, the focus can shift to creating something memorable within it. So, perhaps, with imagination, the things that currently look like intractable problems are actually huge opportunities for new thinking. This is another thing Transition Town Tooting did so brilliantly. They looked at a space full of limits and constraints, a bus turning circle, not a blank canvas of pristine, untouched land, and they still ask that question. We see a lot of this kind of imaginative thinking in the context of sometimes self-imposed constraints, and it pushes innovation forward in remarkable ways. The craft beer movement has boomed as small place-based breweries using local ingredients have proved that they can make far better beer than vast commercial breweries. What if we brewed beer using local wheat, mushrooms, wild herbs, wild yeasts from the air, or leftover bread? The vegan movement has shown that plant-based food can be colourful, delicious, healthy and satisfying despite be constrained, being constrained by no animal products. People and projects around the world have proved that resilient local economies lead to more inventiveness and creativity and vice versa than relying on global supply chains to take care of our communities. This spirit of imagination that arises from bricolage can also be suffocated by policy bureaucracy that sets up false possibilities. For example, in attempts to map the pathway to a low-carbon future, the world's governments have put their faith in negative emissions technologies, NETs, magic technologies which don't exist yet, but which if they did would suck vast amounts of CO2 back out of the atmosphere. Business as usual scenarios, such as those in the Paris Agreement, often assume a large role for NETs. But as Kevin Anderson and John Broderick point out, this endemic bias unreasonably lends support to the continued and long-term use of gas and oil, whilst effectively closing down more challenging but essential debates over lifestyles, profound social economic change and deeper penetration of a genuinely decarbonised energy supply. This kind of deception about our options creates an illusion of possibility which keeps real imagination at bay. We need to master the art, it seems to me, of asking questions which address the gravity of our situation, yet which also create longing, which evoke a deep and rich sense of the wonders we can still create, rather than shutting it down or putting it into the deep sleep of complacency. Thank you very much. From what is to what if. Right, I'm off to do some gardening.